Headache, fever, muscle pain. How many of you have ever taken aspirin in your life? Or maybe I should ask the question, how many aspirins have you taken in your life? Aspirin might seem to be one of the most generic, boring drugs out there. I mean, even the patent underlying aspirin expired already more than 100 years ago. However, this plain, ubiquitous, even cheap pills are one of the drugs that changed the history of medicine forever. It is the first drug we learn to make ourselves. It's the first synthetic drug. And therefore, it makes it a good example to talk about how uncertainty affects R&D in the pharmaceutical industry. So what is the story here? So the active, uh, the active ingredient of aspirin is a chemical compound which is called acetyl salicylic acid. And before we were able to actually make this compound ourselves, more than 3,000 years ago, doctors were using the natural ingredient that was derived from a willow tree in order to cure fever and other types of pains. Now, this knowledge of the ancient Egyptians went lost until the late 18th century, when a British reverend named Edward Stone rediscovered the ingredient and the activeness of willow bark. He published the first scientific article mentioning the clinical effect of willow bark in a scientific journal called Philosophical Transactions. And this marked the spark of a long research trajectory on actually something that led to a compound that is nowadays still in use in aspirin. It was actually in 1828 that Joseph Buchner, a German pharmacist and professor at the University of Munich, actually discovered the active ingredient of willow bark. He used dried willow bark and purified it to find a yellow crystal that he gave the name salicin. And salicin basically is the active ingredient in the tree. This triggered a lot of research interest in the compound that was taken out in a relatively young field, organic chemistry. And a tremendous breakthrough was made in 1838 by an Italian chemist called Raffaele Piria, who was the first person who made a synthetic version of salicin. And whilst this might not sound like a big step for us, in these times, it really changed the approach how people were approaching pharmaceutical research. It was the first time that researchers did not emphasize the refinement and purification of natural ingredients, but really turned to the lab to make synthetic versions of drugs. So people started to test uh, synthetically made salicin. However, it turned out to be a failure in the sense that when used in patients, it triggered a lot of side effects, like gastritis, inflamed stomachs, and so forth. So that was a first failure in this research trajectory. However, people got interested in finding solutions to the challenge, and they were believing if they were able to alter the chemical structure of salicin in a way that keeps the clinical benefits alive, but eradicates side effects, they might have something useful. And later in the history, it was a French chemist named Charles Gerhardt who actually used a process called acetylation to make a variant of salicin, which he called acet acetyl salicylic acid, which is still the compound that is in use in aspirin nowadays. However, again, this compound was put to clinical test, and it turned out that it was not stable. It didn't have any, any beneficial clinical effects. So that yet another failure on the development to those tremendous drugs that we use nowadays. It took another 45 years before the nut actually was cracked, and while there is some controversy who actually deserves the credit for having invented the compound that is in use in aspirin nowadays, most often Felix Hoffmann gets the credit. Felix Hoffmann was an employee of a German company called Bayer, and he was working on a process that allowed to make acetyl salicylic acid in a stable form. So that was the first time that actually we had a compound that was usable. Bayer put this compound into clinical trials. Unfortunately, it turned out that there were no clinical effects to this stable form of aspirin. Now, it seems the story of aspirin is a story of failures. And actually, this is not uncommon in pharmaceutical research. And I would like to show you some results on numbers, what's happening at the moment. So these numbers are derived from a research project that I have done with a co-author of mine, Fabian Gessler, from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. And we were sifting through data on more than 75,000 clinical trial development projects that entered preclinical trials. 
The data allows us to track how far these projects actually advance in the clinical trial processes, going through phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, phase three clinical trials, and ultimately reach the market, which is what every development project actually aims to do so. And once we look at the data, what you see, failure rates are tremendous. 92% of projects that were put in preclinical trials failed before a drug actually reached the market. So tremendous failure rates in the pharmaceutical research industry. So there's a lot of technological uncertainty for anyone who tries to find out how to make a synthetic drug. Luckily, there's a silver lining. The silver lining is a lot of companies try to come up with new drugs. And on this chart, I show you the global number of money that is spent in drug development. This data has been collected by a company called Pharma Projects that samples and surveys what's going on in drug development. And in the year 2019, they're reporting an overall amount of more than 186 billion US dollars spent on developing new drugs. Now, this is spent by 4,000 private companies that in 2019 alone developed and put into trials more than 8,500 different chemical compounds. Now, wait a second, you might wonder, why are these companies doing this? It's very risky, 92% of all these projects won't deliver anything that yields any benefits to these companies. And this brings us back to my story of aspirin. What happened in aspirin is that Arthur Eichengrün, the boss of Felix Hoffmann, responsible for the pharmaceutical developments at Bayer at these times, saw a lot of commercial opportunities in this compound, acetyl salicylic acid, and he ordered to have larger clinical trials, which ultimately showed some clinical benefits of aspirin. Now, as the story goes, on February 27th of 1900, Bayer obtained a patent on this compound, which granted them a near monopoly right on using the underlying compound. And aspirin became one of the most selling drugs in these times. Bayer was able to sell this drug until 1917 in a monopoly, and then the patent expired. So obviously, we, th we see patents play a crucial role in providing an incentive for companies to invest a lot of money in developing new drugs. However, patents come with a downside. Patents don't last forever. So once a patent expires, typically after 20 years, competitors are allowed to use the same ingredient as the originator came up with. And here's a chart that summarizes the effect that happens once a patent expires. Other companies, competitors, are imitating or actually are copying the underlying molecule and are re releasing the same product for a much lower price, eroding the profits the originator company can actually make. Now, where does, where does this put us? I have told you developing drugs is tremendously risky. Remember, 90% failure rate. On the other hand, there's a big reward for these companies. If they're successful, they can get a patent. Unfortunately, however, patents are uncertain in itself. So in the Bayer example, I didn't tell you, Bayer got a patent only in the United States, but the German patent office at these days denied to, get a to give a patent to Bayer. So there's some risk associated with getting a patent in the first place. And the other risk is, how long does a patent last? I also didn't tell you that Bayer was awarded a patent with a duration of 20 years, so it should have lasted until 1920. Unfortunately, the first World War came, and the United States decided to waive the patent rights of Bayer, which was a German company. So there is also uncertainty regarding how long do companies have exclusivity rights. And interestingly, while everyone acknowledges these uncertainties related to patent rights, there is not a lot of research that tells you how strongly do companies react in their R&D initiatives in response to this perceived uncertainty. And I just want to highlight two research results that I was uh, finding in other projects. And in one project, we were looking at the question, what's the risk of getting a patent and how does this affect actual R&D behavior of companies? In this study, which was published in 2016, we were literally looking at what's the chances that a company continues an R&D project once a patent is not awarded. So we are really looking at projects that have been in development and the patent was not awarded. What you find, this has a tremendous effect on responses by companies and the likelihood that companies are abandoning a development project if they don't get a patent right is increasing by 25%. 
So you do have negative effects on private R&D activities driven by institutional uncertainty. Another thing I was looking at with my colleague from Munich, Fabian Gessler, looks at the period of exclusivity that companies can derive from those patents. In this study, we were looking at how do firms respond if they surprisingly learn that the period of exclusivity for projects that they have in development is getting shorter than they thought it would be. So that means the time period in which they have exclusivity on the underlying compound is shortened. That also turns into a reduction of profits they can expect to make from these compounds, obviously. What we find, again, is a relatively strong effect, and for each year in a reduction of the expected duration of exclusivity, companies are reducing their R&D efforts by roughly 12%, which is a quite significant finding. So again, we do find institutional uncertainty in the patent system has a negative effect on private incentives to actually invest in coming up with new drugs. Now, where does this put us, and why am I talking about risks and institutional uncertainty? Because the pandemic, which we are currently all in, is bringing up a lively debate on how we should think about rewarding risks. And when you think about COVID and the ongoing pandemic, a lot of companies are investing private money in order to find vaccines. But again, developing drugs is a risky business, and the risk became apparent when, for instance, the US drug giant Merck was dropping out of the vaccine race by finding the compound they believed to be an effective vaccine was not effective in clinical trials. And the same happened for a French development team around the Institute Pasteur, which also withdrew their compound from the development process. So there is a lot of risk in developing drugs, and we have to reward this risk. And the typical mechanism to reward this risk are patents. And again, the mechanism is the same. So there's a very successful German company, BioNTech, who has a number of relevant patents underlying the vaccine treatment that they developed. And the current market valuation of this company is around 28 billion US dollars. So you do have this big incentive system in place, but now these incentives obviously come with a price. And the price is rewarding risks, also means immediately it limits access of people to those vaccines. And that's the case for all drugs which are under patent protection. So not surprisingly, the public is pushing big drug makers to give away their patents for free to ensure free access for people to get access to those vaccines. I just put up two headlines in, in, in my charts here. And this is an interesting question because it's actually a dilemma. What is the dilemma? In the short term, you might think this is a good idea, withdraw patents from the owner and make beneficial drugs available for everyone, which is a short-term sh short solution. In the long term, however, and that's the unpleasant truth, you are certainly limiting incentives for companies to further invest in drug development, as my re research has shown. Now, this poses a dilemma, and this dilemma is not a new one. This dilemma is as old as patents are coming. If you reward risky R&D endeavors, you are on the same side restricting access to those. As dilemmas are always, by definition, forcing you to make a choice between two unpleasant options, I don't want to give you an answer which choice is the better one. But I hope that my talk gives you relevant information to be able to participate in the public discussion that is currently going on. Thank you very much. Thanks.